On today's episode, Chris Revelle holds a lobster, Christian Lungard tries to fly at Laguna Seca, and Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen laugh at a young British boy. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. I'm Matt. Yeah, we had a pretty eventful weekend. We had NASCAR Cup and Xfinity up in New Hampshire, Formula One over in Barcelona, IndyCar out at Laguna Seca, and the six hours of Watkins Glen for the IMSA series, which was more like the four hours plus a long red flag for rain, and then we got back to racing, much like the NASCAR Cup Series race, which saw an abundance of cautions on Sunday, and it saw the race go from basically a little after 2 p.m. East Coast time to right around 8 p.m. on the East Coast. So, an endurance race in their own right. It was nearly four hours of on-track action, and we saw a lot of things happen, and it resulted in Chris Rebell holding the lobster at the end of the race there. Kyle Busch probably doesn't really want to get back into an RCR car at this point. Like I said on Twitter, maybe maybe just wants to pull Avante Davis and retire at the stage break or during that red flag, which he should have because the guy looked super, super bummed out walking back to his rental car after his third incident of the day, the one that finally took him out, which was him crashing crashing under caution. Just a really, really bad day for Kyle Busch. And honestly, he doesn't deserve what RCR has done to him at this point. He probably should have just taken that pay cut to remain at Joe Gibbs Racing uh, because I think he desperately regrets making this move now. Last year was all fun and games for the first 16 races. Knocked off three wins. It's like, oh man, Kyle Busch is bringing RCR back to prominence. Finally, they got another driver in there that can overdrive the equipment and make them look better than they actually are. Dale Earnhardt did it for years. Uh, Kevin Harvick did it for years. Now it's Kyle Busch's turn. And now Kyle just seemingly is like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this anymore. Get the man an actual teammate too. No offense to Austin Dillon, but Kyle Busch needs somebody that he can work with. And honestly, Austin Dillon just isn't that guy. It is indicative of how bad they're running when Kyle Busch is running with Austin Dillon in the back. If Kyle Busch can't even get that car to run better than Austin Dillon, I mean, what are we doing at this point? But the race did see a lot of action. It started off early with Chris or Chase Elliott, rather, blasting out to the lead. I did a full race review. If you want to go ahead and watch that, I'm not going to use the same jokes here again. Don't worry about that. But Chase Elliott blasted off to the lead. And then C Bell reeled him back in like he was in your local bass fishing tournament. Not Kevin Van Dam at the Bassmaster Classic, but just your local guy slowly getting him back in and then capitalized on it there and took the win. Stage one win, rather. He did go on to win the race. But yeah, it looked like Chase might be a factor early, and then his car kind of faded, and he held on to his top 20 streak. Once again, uh, he finished, uh, I believe, 19th from the day. So for Chase, it was certainly not the day that it started off to be, but things got real weird uh, a little bit later into into the race you got to run in between Denny Hamlin and Kyle Larson once again and I think people are kind of getting this confused on the internet when we're talking about this we're strictly talking about Kyle Larson and Denny Hamlin I don't really care what Kyle Larson does to other drivers does he use people up sure does everybody use people up absolutely but when it comes to the 11 and the 5 and their relationship on track it's the 11 taking advantage of the 5 every single time and Kyle Larson spotter Tyler Mon was apparently pretty annoyed by this and he said basically You know why he keeps doing this, right? Because you let him. And Kyle was not happy about it and told him to shut the F up. Which, that's the bad word that Kyle said on the radio. Nothing worse than that. Don't anybody put memes out there on the internet. He said the F-U-C-K word, not the other F word. Which would send him to sensitivity training. And certainly not what he said. So, whatever. You guys get what I'm saying here. Moving on to what else happened in the race. Like I said, Kyle Busch was involved in three different incidents on uh, Sunday. Brad Keselowski and Martin Truex Jr. came together. Ross Chastain spun out. Uh, Alex Bowman blew up, which you don't typically see that happen very often anymore. But, you know, it does happen. And the run of Hendrick Motorsports just not giving a damn about New Hampshire continued on. They haven't won at the racetrack since... Casey Kane did it in 2012, which feels like a lifetime ago at this point. Casey Kane's added two kids in that time period, retired, still trying to get that first World of Outlaws win, which is going to be really difficult considering he raced on high limit, but he's never won a World of Outlaws race feature. And I think that just blows people's mind when you think about it. Because, I mean, a 50-something-year-old Dave Blaney did it just a couple years ago at Sharon. So, yeah, Casey Kane, get that World of Outlaws win or get a high limit win. Come on. We just want to celebrate that. How the heck do we get on Casey Kane talking about this year's New Hampshire race? You also had a pretty big pile up. Austin Dillon, Bubba Wallace, No Gragson were all involved in that. And Bubba went and parked right in front of No Gragson on pit road. And some people are like, oh, he didn't do that on purpose. I don't know. It felt like it was on purpose a little bit there. But regardless, it looked like Bubba kind of got his bell rung a little bit. So hopefully he's okay after 
after that hit that he took there. He was excited about getting on rain tires. It just didn't really work out for him. On the topic of rain tires. So the rain was coming started to spring hole nascar throws the caution and then ultimately the red flag with you know about something 80 ish laps to go in this race if i remember correctly so then we're all sitting around sitting on pit road and if you can't tell right now i got my feet kicked up i'm not wearing socks i don't want to put my feet up on camera uh no free feet pics from the break hard show but so we're sitting around and everybody's like okay um it's gonna rain and then a half an hour has gone by, still hasn't rained, at least not to the level of really warranting, not going out there on wet weather tires. So then it finally does rain and everyone's like, did we really just sit around for 35-ish minutes to wait for the rain to come just to call this race? Because that would have been super annoying. And no, to NASCAR's credit, they did wait it out. And I'll be honest, a lot of us on social media, on Twitter specifically, were furious with what this was, what was going on on the racetrack. So I still stand by the fact that they could have put wet weather tires on right when that caution first came out and sent them out there and probably done another, what, 30-ish laps, probably before the rain actually did come. And when it did rain, it it rained. It was a torrential downpour there for, for a few minutes. But to NASCAR's credit, they waited it out. They went out there after the rain had finally stopped, and all they did was clear the standing water off the racetrack, left it wet, put wet weather tires on, and sent the field out there. And what we got in return was a fantastic race. Turns out to make the short track package work, you just have to make the racetrack wet and put wet weather tires on because these guys are out there going five, four wide through the corners, running the wall at New Hampshire. Don't typically see that ever happen, running the apron. I mean, I'm talking about a difference of five, six different lanes here. And it was really cool to see. It was definitely the best racing we had seen all day, much like we saw at North Wilkesboro, much like we saw at Richmond earlier this year. So it worked out really well. And unfortunately, it, it didn't necessarily carry. And then NASCAR still has a closed pit road where you can only come down and change tires when they tell you you can change tires, which got really frustrating because I think some guys would have liked to make the switch to slicks. And honestly, I, I know their long-term plan is to be able to allow that. I get it. 100% understand that's where they're coming from. It would have been really fun to see it happen on Sunday. And I know that people are like, well, what if teams go out there and wreck on slicks? Well, then they wreck. Like, that's the bed that they made, so they had to lie in it. If they're going to go out and wreck, then then they wreck. Um, but I know the long-term plan is for that. Ultimately, having live pit stops when the track is wet is difficult. They're really concerned about pit road being wet still, guys coming in, sliding through their box, hitting another car, hitting another crew member, something like that. Again, completely understand the safety aspect of that. What I would like to see is when they bring them down a closed pit road is teams get the option. You can either put the wet weather tires on or you can put the dry tire, the slicks on and go from there. So hopefully we get to see that in the near future. But other than that, I liked what we saw out of it. I didn't love the fact that NASCAR basically got bullied into allowing teams to change tires with that caution in the final, what, 10-ish laps of the race. I would have liked to have seen them just go out there and run. Like, if you blister your tires, that's kind of on you for going out there and run hard. Other guys didn't blister their tires. It's all about tire management at the end of the day. Uh, but that whole process right there needed to really be streamlined because they weren't going to change tires. And then a couple laps went by under caution and teams bullied them into changing tires. And that was just a lot of wasted laps and time. So again, I get it. We're in the infancy stages of this. It's a growing pain, but I would ultimately like to see it happen. But at the end of the race there, we had a couple of different restarts. Michael McDowell, knowing that he needs to win, get into the playoffs. He sends it on Ryan Blaney there, uh, takes himself and Blaney out. Unfortunate. Blaney was like, yeah, that was a low percentage move. That was dumb. Michael went down and apologized to it. But ultimately, Chris Bell ends up winning the race. Uh, Chase Briscoe comes home second, which is a funny one-two pairing considering what just happened this weekend when C. Bell spoiled the news that <laughs> that um, Christopher, or Chase Briscoe rather was coming to Joe Gibbs Racing in 2025. And then Josh Berry gets a top three finish with a third place there. He was rolling all day. And man, if that caution doesn't come out for Brad Keselowski being spun and stuck in the middle of the racetrack, and credit to NASCAR for holding that caution literally as long as they could. It's a one-mile racetrack. They held that caution for nine-tenths of a mile. Um, and then Brad finally got going right as they hit it, which is just unfortunate timing. But I think Josh maybe could have 
got to at least the bumper of the 20 car who knows what would happen after that obviously the restart uh two laps which just wasn't enough time for him to get back there but really strong run for him hopefully we get some news out of that josh berry camp in the very near future about what his future plans are for 2025 and beyond so yeah christopher bell wins the race his third of the year he now sits second on the playoff grid one point in playoff points behind kyle larson so yeah ultimately a pretty solid race from new hampshire i'd probably give it like a an 80 maybe uh, there's still some work to do with that short track package and flat tracks in general still probably need a little bit more tire wear on the slicks and everything like that but the rain certainly added a much needed element to the race nascar saturday xfinity series race from loudon as well was pretty solid and chris rebel once again went ahead and won the race chris rebel at new hampshire is more reliable than i don't know a 20 year old honda civic at this point you don't even need to put oil in it it's going to just keep going you put christopher bell at new hampshire in an xfinity car yeah he's just going to win he's now four for four in his xfinity series career at new hampshire but it didn't come without having to really battle and i think cole custer was easily the best car of the day he led 114 laps on saturday uh, but at the end of the race there things got kind of jumbled up sheldon creed once again gets a second place finish he now has 10 second place finishes um daniel hemrick dale jarrett and now sheldon creed just not the company you want to be in you would like to win a race at some point but he just finds new ways to kind of lose races there at the end cole custer kind of got shuffled out there i would if i was cole i would not be happy about how that race ended either uh so yeah the the race overall xfinity's continues to absolutely uh deliver you have some guys out there that absolutely do not need to be out there i'm not going to name names here we don't want to publicly shame but certain people back in the 30s uh, just shouldn't be out there it's, uh, maybe a driver of the 15 car who con continually finds themselves in precarious situations some other cars out there too that were just man just not not to the level that they should be out there the six the 35 maybe even the 29 to an extent just some of these people yeah uh, there it's a development series i get it but man just some bad driving overall but for the race like i said xfinity continues to deliver carson quapel making another start in that jrm number 88 gets another top five finish he has only started four races this year and he is only 30 ish points behind haley deegan in the playoffs or in the driver standings and Haley Deegan started all 16 of those races so not ideal for her but let's move on to the dumb move of the weekend my Stephen Wallace dumb move of the weekend goes to this moronic fan at the IndyCar race on Saturday during the practice session or maybe it was in qualifying at Laguna Seca who climbed through one of the photo holes out onto a live racetrack sat next to the wall to record the cars going by because somehow being on that side of the wall versus being six inches and leaning through the photo hole just wasn't enough for him idiotic move never ever 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 get onto a live racetrack a car goes spinning off right there even if it doesn't look like a spot where a car will crash if there's one thing you should know about race cars if there's a spot where a car can crash they will ultimately find that spot eventually they always do what's the worst spot they could crash at oh it'll never happen there trust me it'll happen there just give it some time this guy got so lucky he did not you know get hit by a race car or do something dumber there's a reason those fences exist do not climb through those fences. Obviously, this fan is just an absolute mouth breather moron. Climb back through that hole and then try to evade security by hiding out in a bushel of poison oak by the sounds of it before getting arrested and kicked off of property. Just a really stupid move. I think everybody that watches is probably smart enough to know that you don't get onto a hot racetrack. This fan that did it right here, dummy. So don't do that. Moving on to the Formula One in IndyCar open wheel portion of the schedule or schedule show show here we had the indycar series out at laguna seca which was supposed to be on usa with a lead-in from the nascar cup series instead nbc usa was like pound salt to indycar we're gonna leave nascar on and then we'll just have them eat up your entire window and never put indycar on uh usa once the cup series race finally did end Meanwhile, they put the IndyCar race on CNBC as well as on Peacock. And at first, they only announced that it was going to be on Peacock. And man, were people pissed. They were like, I have cable already. I was expecting to watch this race. Now I have to pay for Peacock to watch it. Unfortunate there. But Alex Polo does come out on top using a pretty risky strategy, even one that he said he was second guessing in the car. There was an interesting um, caution 
period. Marcus Armstrong has a has a wreck. He's sitting on the racetrack and he's sitting there on a hot racetrack with cars continually going by him. And instead of IndyCar throwing a caution, they decide to try to let the green flag pit stops play out. And as soon as Joseph Newgarden is in an advantageous position to take advantage of this, they throw the caution and he gets the restart second. And man, were people not happy about that. And we said it before and we'll say it again. That's the problem when you have the owner of the series also fielding the best team in the series. You continually have instances like this where people are questioning the legality of what's happening here and the, the sanctity of what's going on. And that's why so many NASCAR teams don't want the France family to own a charter. Same thing that we're seeing right here because you're constantly having to deal with questions about favoritism for it. So ultimately it ends up not mattering because Newgarden got swallowed up on the restart and then he ends up sending himself off the racetrack anyways. So whatever, it, it at the end of the day didn't matter. But uh, just frustrating that that even has to be talked about. It looked like Alexander Rossi was in position to uh, potentially win this race, but uh, strategy didn't work out for him. He gets a third place finish on Sunday. Christian Lungard went through the corkscrew, got bounced out, and he went flying down the down the hillside there. Attempted to take flight. Thankfully, he did He did not. Augustine Canapino sent Kiffin Simpson for a wreck, and I'm sure the Argentinian fans will somehow say it's Kiffin Simpson's fault and want to send him a bunch of death threats, but it was Augustine Canapino's fault, whether you want to admit that or not. I'm sure he's going to be liking all the hate posts like crazy, though, on Twitter now that likes are, are hidden, so he doesn't have to worry about that again. Overall, IndyCar at Laguna Seca continues to just be uh, a great time, and I think it's one of those races I'm going to have to get to next year because it just looks like a good time, and the track is phenomenal from uh, top to bottom. Graham Rahal also involved in the incident as well. Um, same day that his father-in-law, John Force, was involved in a major incident uh, in Virginia in that NHRA race. John got out of the car. He was alert. He was talking to medical. Um, he is going to be okay by the sounds of it. But for Graham, not a, not a great weekend. Once again, he had nowhere to go. He just got kind of got caught up in that incident there as well. But yeah, IndyCar at, at Laguna always is good. The Formula One race from Spain. So Barcelona used to be one of my least favorite races on the schedule, mainly because they did a ton of testing there. Everybody had the track figured out and that final sector specifically coming out onto the front stretch. I hated that stupid little double chicane setup thing that they had there. They've now gotten rid of that and finally went back to the sweeper. And I think it does make the racing at uh, Barcelona better. Barcelona, if you you know did two weeks of a uh, study abroad and now all of a sudden you think that you're Spanish and you speak with a lisp. Okay, congratulations, you're cultured. For the actual race, though, Max Verstappen ends up winning. Surprise, surprise there. But the field has certainly gotten closer to him. Lando Norris was on pole. George Russell went from fourth to first in the first corner. He had the lead, and then Max took it back what, what, on lap two or three, and that was basically it. If Lando doesn't have a bad start, and he doesn't get stuck behind George, and he has a faster pit stop, he probably wins the race. But that is a very typical case of coulda, shoulda, woulda, and we don't deal in the world of hypotheticals over here. Max Verstappen is your winner. Lando Norris second. Lewis Hamilton third, his first podium of the season in his farewell season with Mercedes. It was a funny moment in the post-race presser when Lando was talking about contact that he had earlier in the race and he was like oh i think i left him enough room and max and lewis both openly laughed at him they're like be for real dude <laughs> like that's just not happening and then lando uh, being a young boy that's emotional was like i'm just gonna stop talking now okay he seemed like he was in a mood all week and i don't know what was going on with lando there specifically on sunday but yeah uh it was fine it was one of the better formula one races of the year but still the max show however everybody's gotten closer to him which is nice to see. We'll see how the uh, the field goes in Austria and what the British Grand Prix coming up here soon. So Yeah, looking ahead to what we have this upcoming weekend. We finally have the NASCAR uh Cup Xfinity and Truck Series all back in action at the Nashville Super Speedway, which is not really that super, but they can call it a super speedway if they want to. The Intermediate Concrete Oval, uh, 40 minutes outside of Nashville, also home to the IndyCar Finale this year as well, uh, which will be certainly interesting. And then we also have the Formula One Austrian Grand Prix on Sunday morning as well. Should be a pretty good weekend of racing, specifically on the NASCAR side. Nashville's been pretty good since they've gone back there. Trucks are on Friday night 
Xfinity Saturday Cup on Sunday. So, so I'm excited to see how all of that goes. So let me know in the comments what you thought about all the racing this weekend. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.